Okay, we're on the air. Uh, I think we're a little loud, actually, on the air. So let's turn this down a bit. So I'm now maxing out and clipping everywhere. Clip, clip, clipping, 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 checking, checking. I should try to remember to delete this when we're done. Okay, this looks pretty good. Um, full voice. Okay, this looks good. All right. Uh, no, nope, still some clipping going on there. And. All right, this looks nice. All right, this is our lecture on, well, the very first lecture on hypothesis testing with two means instead of just one. Hypothesis testing with two means is just a direct extension of what happens with a single mean. It's just that now, instead of being interested in the value of a single mean as the thing we're testing and trying to estimate in the population using our samples, now we're estimating and testing the value of the difference between two means. So we have to shift our brains and stop thinking about a single mean value and start thinking about the value that results when you subtract one mean from another, so the difference between means. <coughs> so here are some examples of the kinds of research questions that we might have. Uh, do community college students have more life skills than university students if that was measured by some sort of um, measure. Now this would have to be measured in a single numerical variable. This only applies to a one numerical variable measured in two separate groups. Or are there more symptoms for some condition or disease in, other, in men versus women? So you'd have these two groups, men versus women. Mean for men, mean for women. Is diagnosis accuracy improved by training? Now this is a little bit of a different situation. The implication is that there would be uh, a group of people who are being trained to diagnose something, let's say doctors, and uh, the, a training program was the intervention. And so you'd estimate their accuracy in diagnosing by giving them a test before the training, and then you'd give them the same test after the training. Same group of people measured twice, but you'd still have two means. And there's a different procedure for doing that that we'll learn in a few lectures. First, we're going to focus on this issue of um, two separate groups of cases. So does Duracell or Energizer last longer? You'd probably get a random sample of Duracell batteries, a random sample of Energizer batteries, and then see how long each one lasted. And take the mean from each group. Is Finnish or Navajo easier to learn? You might take a group of people and have them learn Finnish, and another group of people to learn Navajo, and or you could have the same group of people learning both and measure how long it took or the difficulty in some way uh, of learning each of those. Which type of TV show has more acts of violence, action, adventure, or comedy? And so that's two separate groups of individuals or cases. Each individual would be a TV show here, and you'd randomly sample action adventure shows, and then randomly sample comedy shows. Get the mean number of violent acts per hour for action adventure, the mean for comedy, and then compare those two and see which one was higher. So when you have two means, then we're going to start with the situation well, we always have two groups of observations, and we're going to start with the situation where that actually means two groups of cases, though, as I've just mentioned, it doesn't always mean that. <coughs> and each group of observations provides you a mean, a sample mean, and each sample mean is an estimate of its population mean. So that's the setup here. Instead of having one group of observations with a sample mean, and then that sample mean, an estimate of the population mean, now we just multiply that by two. We've got two groups. Each group has an estimate of the population sample mean. And the research question we usually have is, are, both, are, are the population means equal to each other? The null hypothesis is that they are equal. The alternative is that they're not equal. And this becomes interesting. So do Duracell batteries last longer than Energizer batteries? The population mean of Duracell would be like maybe mu1, and you might make mu2 the population mean of Energizer. So you'd sample from each of those groups trying to estimate the mean and see if they're the same. So asking this question of the population means being equal is equivalent to saying, did the samples come from the same population, or are there two different populations that they came from? So how do we do this? We reduce everything to differences. So in statistics, it's very common to try and come up with a single sampling distribution of something or other. And to do that, then you have to have every test or every situation or every group or something reduced to a single number. We've done that so far by taking a mean from a whole bunch of observations, and that takes multiple numbers and turns them into one number. That one number is the mean. And now we're going to do it uh, again, another level of complexity. We're going to take these two means and subtract them from each other, and the result is a single number. 
So our null hypothesis now could be uh, mu1 minus mu2 equals 0, or mu1 minus mu2 is not equal to 0. That's a two-tailed null hypothesis there. This is equivalent to saying mu1 equals mu2, or mu1 is not equal to mu2. You can write your hypotheses either way on exams and homeworks and things like that. <coughs> so if the sample mean is an estimate of a population mean, like so, here's your sample, and then you imagine in the population, all these values came from some population, and then your sample mean is your best estimate of that population mean. Here's your sample mean here, and your best estimate of your population mean up here. So if that's what's going on with a single mean situation, and I can't advance slides, Oh, yeah, those are. And then you've got this sampling distribution of means that is implied, and your sample mean fits somewhere in that sampling distribution of means. And that's a t-test, or a z-test. And if your sample mean is really far over here, then you have a small p-value, or really far over here, you have a small p-value going that way. If it's really close to the population mean, well, the null hypothesis population mean anyway. We don't really know what the population mean truly is, we, we guess. If that's the case, then the difference between means can be an estimate of the difference between population means. So the difference between means and the samples can be an estimate of the difference between means in the population. So now we have this situation. <coughs> Two samples. We've got the, in this case, red and blue. I, th I think I turned them to blue and green later. So blue sample and red sample. Popul sample one, sample two, they come from population 1 and population 2. We can just measure the difference between those two means and the null hypothesis, these two means are stacked right on top of each other here, see? So the null hypothesis says that the two population means are equal and the two populations are basically one population. Now the dashed line is always my little shorthand indication of the raw scores because this is the little diagonal thingy here graph I made. That's my representation right now of the um, sampling distribution of means. But this dashed line, the gray dashed line, is the representation of the raw scores. So the two populations of raw scores are equal and the two populations of means are equal according to the null hypothesis. So we can construct a sampling distribution not just of means but of differences between two means. So we imagine all possible sample means from population 1 and all possible sample means from population 2 being paired up in all possible ways and taking all possible combinations of mean 1 minus mean 2, mean 1 minus mean 2, and that forms this green distribution up here, the distribution of all possible sample means, or sorry, all possible differences between sample means from population 1 and 2, if the two populations are the same. So we could make it of anything, like if the two populations had a difference of five points or something like that, but we don't. We say the null hypothesis mean is always zero in these cases. There are ways to make it otherwise, but nobody ever does it, so we're not going to talk about that too much. And then we take our sample mean, and we see where does it fit. Now, the reason this sample mean went over to the left here is because it's x bar 1 minus x bar 2. So this distribution is all possible x bar 1 minus x bar 2's. That's why I put that on this little line here. Down here it says x bar to remind myself that everything in this sampling distribution here is a mean, a sample mean. <clears throat> Up here x bar 1 minus x bar 2 reminds me that everything in this distribution is a difference between means and the order matters. Uh, it doesn't really matter which way you specify it, but you have to specify it the same every single time throughout your your hypothesis and your tests and your results. You've got to keep that kind of straight most of the time. So if it's 1 minus 2, blue minus purple, well, 1 is lower than 2. So the mean here, this, this vertical pale blue line, is lower than this vertical red line, right? So the group 1 mean is lower than group 2, so 1 minus 2 is a negative number. Since the middle here is 0, then we know that this difference in sample means that we got from our sample compared to all possible differences in sample means from all possible combinations of sample means if the null hypothesis is true, then that difference has to be to the left of zero because it's going to be a negative difference. The null hypothesis says that the average difference will be zero. The average difference between any two sample means will be zero. And our difference is less than zero because a lower number minus a higher number is negative. 
and then that gives us our t observed, and the area beyond that is the p. And then if that's less than alpha, we reject the null hypothesis. So once we get to this point of specifying the sampling distribution of differences between means, then we've got a setup that's pretty much the same as everything else we've been doing. So the null hypothesis is what we've always talked about before, nothing to see here, etc. And in differences between means, it's literally always this. Now there might be some rare exceptions to this, but you're never going to find them, so I'm not going to talk about them in this undergrad course. You could specify the null hypothesis, say that difference in means should be plus 2.7 or minus 12 or something like that, but nobody really does that. It's so incredibly uncommon that I could search for a long time before I found an example. Everybody just says there is no difference between mu1 and mu2. So when we specify the distribution according to the null hypothesis, it's all possible differences between sample means. Sample means uh, sample mean 1 that came from population 1 with the same sample size as our sample size, and sample mean 2 that came from population 2 with the same sample size as our sample size. We're assuming that our samples are just some random sampling variation of all possible samples that could have come uh, out of those populations of, of raw scores and calculating those means, and that the means are the same because the null hypothesis assumes that the means are equal. <coughs> now there's a little flip. Uh, it might not be critical that you really get this, but it sure will help. We've got a distribution of the null hypothesis, and then the null hypothesis says all possible sample means came from a situation in which the population means of, of population 1 and population 2 were equal, so mu1 equals mu2. Therefore, you, couldn't, you can certainly get a sample mean from mu1 that's higher than mu2, or mu2 that's higher than mu1, so you can get an x bar 1 that's greater than x bar 2, or an x bar 2 that's greater than x bar 1. All those are possible, but just like random sampling means, random sampling differences between means, there will be variability, and we're really interested in that variability. We've got to specify it. That's the standard error. But uh, on average, if the null hypothesis is true, the mean difference so some differences, this will be bigger than this, and sometimes this will be bigger than this. But on average, if the null hypothesis is true, the mean difference will be zero. That's what the null hypothesis is saying. It's saying if mu1 equals mu2, then on average, x bar 1 minus x bar 2 with infinite random sampling will be zero, the average. But there will be all possible examples of x bar 1 being greater than 2 or less than 2. It's just that the average will be zero. And the shape of this distribution will be t. Actually, technically, it's a normal distribution, but in order to accurately estimate that normal distribution, we have to use a t distribution. And the standard deviation of that distribution, the distribution of all possible differences between means, the standard deviation of a sampling distribution, we change the name and we call it a standard error. And this time, if you want to be technical, we'd say it's the standard error of differences between means or differences between pairs of means. Sometimes we just say the standard error of the difference. So looking back at these examples, looking at null hypothesis situations, in the, com in the community college and university college situation I had before, the null hypothesis might be that there is actually no difference in the population in life skills between community college and university students. Or in the symptom situation, men and women have equal symptom severity. The null hypothesis says the two means are equal. Equal means no difference. <coughs> or in this situation, diagnostic accuracy isn't improved. There's no change. The mean accuracy at time 1 doesn't go up or down by time 2. Nothing has changed at all according to the null hypothesis. And of course you're trying to show that something changed. Duracell and Energizer last equally long. Now if you're from Energizer, that's not what you're interested in finding. That's just your null hypothesis and you hope you find that Energizer lasts longer or something. Finnish and Navajo are equally difficult to learn. The alternative would be that they're not equal or that one is more difficult or something. And action, adventure, and comedy shows have equal average numbers of violence backs per hour. These are all examples of null hypotheses. Null hypotheses of the type that we have in two sample uh, hypothesis test situations. So running through this again, you've got your sample mean from group one and your sample mean from sample two. So you've got two samples, two sample means. You find the difference between those sample means and then you imagine that each of those samples came from a population. A population you can't directly observe, of course, otherwise we wouldn't be doing this. If you could directly observe it, skip all this and do the easy part and just find out what the mean is. But we can't observe it, so we have to do all this. And the distribution of all possible means 
is probably not the same, but the null hypothesis says those two means are the same. In the population, those two populations are identical. And that the only reason why it looks like there are any differences between means is just, in, in our sample, it's just random sampling. Sometimes random sampling makes it look like there are differences, right? And therefore, we can imagine all possible differences between means if the null hypothesis is true. In other words, all possible differences between means if there's actually no difference between the population means that those two samples came from. And the shape of that will be normal, or t as we have to use it to estimate normal. The standard deviation will be the standard error. So as soon as we know that, we know we can use the normal approximation to figure out p-values and alpha. Well, you don't figure out alpha, you just set it, but you can figure out p-values. And so if you've got this situation, it doesn't matter whether the two means are really high or really low or anywhere in between. All that matters is that they're the same. So we don't even bother saying what the two sample means are when we're doing a null hypothesis test. Or sorry, the two population means are. We definitely say what the two sample means are. Um, we just care that the two population means are equal. So that's all we have to say is that the two population means are equal. And if they're equal, then we have that same sampling distribution of differences between means according to the null hypothesis. So let me just go back through this little animation again. Notice that the green distribution doesn't move. That's on purpose. I, I made this animation on purpose. Because as long as the, sam as the population means are the same, then all possible differences between them look exactly like this with a, a mean of zero if you know, assuming the null hypothesis is true. So if the two population means are the same, then that's the distribution. This green distribution is what it is, and the mean of that is zero. The, the average x bar 1 minus x bar 2, that average value is zero. So our x bar 1 minus x bar 2 fits somewhere in there. And in this case, it doesn't fit on the positive side because this is the same situation as before. We have, if blue is sample 1, then... Um, sample 1 mean is actually lower than sample 2 mean, so it needs to be a negative value, 1 minus 2. Now, if we were calculating everything with 2 minus 1, and you can do that, there's no problem, just remember to reverse everything, and then this would be a positive value. So you've just got to keep straight which is which. Once you make a decision, I'm going to do 1 minus 2, keep it consistent through your whole analysis. <coughs> so hypothesis testing ends up being the same as before. You specify your hypotheses, you draw your graph, put stuff on it, you find your t-critical, you calculate your t-observed, you compare observed to t-critical, and then you make a decision about the null hypothesis and state your conclusion. That's it. It's the same, same thing we've done before. The technical part is calculating t-observed, and you'll be wrapped up in that for a little while the first few times you go through this by hand. But that will become easy if you do this 5 or 10 or 20 times. It'll become as easy as your times tables, or easier because you don't really have to memorize very much. You can just look at formulas. But this technical part always takes the same, same, same format. Every time we do a hypothesis test, it's always some Z-like score that results from taking a point estimate of something we're interested in minus the value that the null hypothesis says it should have in the population divided by the standard error of that thing because we're always specifying a sampling distribution of the point estimate. And so this is how we fit the point estimate in with all possible point estimates that could have happened. So in this case, the point estimate is no longer a sample mean. It's a difference between two sample means. The null value is almost always zero. The standard error, it just has a formula, and I'll show you. <coughs> the formula used to be um, n over, or sorry, uh, standard deviation of the sample over square root of n minus 1. Well, now it's slightly more complicated, but it's the same idea. You just find the formula, look it up. It'll be provided on exams. So these tests, questions that I've been using to hopefully make your mind run through things multiple times and kind of get things organized. What's the sample point estimate? Now it's the difference between two sample means. It was a sample mean. Now it's a difference between two means. What's the sampling distribution of it? It's called the sampling distribution of differences. And it's composed of all possible differences between sample means. It's T-shaped, the way we estimate it, although we're estimating a normal distribution. And it has a degrees of freedom. And you have to look and find what the degrees of freedom are. There's Just like there's a formula for the standard error, there's a little formula to find out what the degrees of freedom are for every different, types of, different type of T-test. So you just know that formula. What is the mean of this sampling distribution of differences? Is zero. That's easy. It's easier than the one sample situation. You don't have to think carefully about what your null hypothesis mean is. 
what's the standard error? Well, it depends on the test. It's called the standard error of the differences, uh, or the difference between means, but you just have to look it up. So in this example, I'm just going to run through these examples now, not with really any calculations, just to show you how things work out. The null hypothesis, there's no difference in life skills. Alternative, let's say it's a directional, hyper, a turn, uh, directional alternative hypothesis where community college students have more life skills because, you know, they have to, like, go pick up the kids from daycare and have a part-time job off campus, which I realize some university students do too. I certainly did. Um, let's say you use some sort of um, questionnaire, the life skills assessment scale or something like that. Well, then we could imagine that the distribution of means might look like this. Now, this is a little software application I wrote in R that just shows the distribution of the confidence intervals. So these are confidence intervals for mu1 and mu2. So mu1 is community college students and mu2 is university students. The way I specified it, I made up some fake values using some randomization. Um, and this is the life skills thing. So the community college students have life skills of 46.3 or something like that. Community college and university students have 43. <coughs> so this is kind of our best guess about what might be happening in the population. However, the null hypothesis says that the differences between means are exactly equal. So this really isn't the null hypothesis. This is just confidence intervals for each one. And uh, so we might say that this is how things turned out. So I made up some fake data. We would have t-critical on the positive side here. We'd find the right degrees of freedom. We'd look up our t-critical. This is the distribution of all possible differences between means. These are raw score differences. The middle is zero. And for t-scores, the middle is 0, too. So t-scores are just different scores standardized. But now you'll have different scores not standardized. So this is points on this scale. And then this is different scores standardized. Now this is 2 point, I don't know, 7 points or something like that on the raw score scale that turns into a 1.7 t-score. Yeah, there's like 1, 2, uh, oh no, sorry, the t-observed here is 3.2 or something like that. So like 3.2 difference. And so in this case, the difference was like 3.2. So the observed value just goes exactly where the difference goes, and then we where the raw score difference goes. We turn that into t-score, which turns out to be about 1.7. Can't you see it's not quite to 2 yet? But there's not all possible values on these scales. you got to stop your software coding somewhere. Anyway, let's look at this other example. Men and women have equal symptom severity, um, but the alternative hypothesis says, let's say two-tailed, they have different severity and they use some sort of symptom severity rating scale where high is bad. Mu1, let's say, 1 is men, 2 is women, and men have like a 10.3 something, women have like an 8.7 on that scale. And this is the distribution, our, our best estimate, confidence intervals, but the null hypothesis says these two means are actually equal. So the null hypothesis says that the difference should be like this. Here's the absolute differences in scores, Here's the t-score of the, of the absolute differences in scores. And so our t-observed is negative 1.8. So, um, oh, I think I said this should be, yeah. Oh, this is just my t-observed having a glitch. It should just say 1.78 1. there. Sorry, my coding wasn't perfect there. But, oops. So anyway, t-observed is positive 1.78 because this is 1.78 t-score points above this, which is like, 1.6 or something raw score points above it. And because it's a two-tailed test, we have an implied t. You don't have to worry about that. All you have to worry about is t critical is in these tails, because alpha was 0.01 here, and our t observed does not make it. So we fail to reject that null hypothesis, and we say men and women have similar symptom severity. Let's say diagnosis accuracy improved by training. The null hypothesis says it is not. And let's say our dependent variable is accuracy percentage accuracy in diagnostic tests. And mu1 is accuracy before training, and mu2 is accuracy after training. So in this case, we, we think that mu1 uh, should be lower than mu2, yes. And mu2 should be higher, so 1 minus 2 should be a negative number. So lower accuracy, higher accuracy. So if we're doing 1 minus 2, now we could just flip it around and do 2 minus 1. That's what most people would do. I don't know why I did it this way maybe to show you a negative tailed test. So 1 minus 2 is going to be a negative number, so it'll have a negative t-score. t-critical is negative 1.67, which we would have found by using the right degrees of freedom, looking in a t-table. And our t-observed, which we used by using the formula, which we found by using the formula, is negative 2.25. It's in the rejection region. It's in the right direction. 
Therefore, we reject the null hypothesis, and we say, yeah, diagnostic accuracy was totally improved. And now Duracell, Duracell versus Energizer. Say, number of hours that it takes to drain the battery. Let's say we did a two-tailed test. Say that there was no difference, or there is a difference. Uh, again, I've got this problem. There's a negative up there. <coughs> or there shouldn't be. I'll have to recode this and fix that bug. Anyway, here's the estimates of what's going on in the population based on what the sample means are. And totally different from that, the null hypothesis says these sample means should be exactly equal. And if they were equal, then having this amount of difference, 5.7 to 6.1, which is hours, which is what I imagine, uh, is actually pretty predictable. It's like a 0 0.4 4 hour difference. It's not a very big difference, apparently. It's not that many standard errors. It's only like one standard error, where it needed to be about two standard errors to reject the null hypothesis. So we say Energizer and Duracell don't have any difference. Finnish and Navajo are equally difficult to learn, but maybe somebody says Navajo is more difficult. You know, the code talkers and all that. Percent mastery after one year of intensive training. Here we go. Let's say we took Finnish minus Navajo here, and we found that one is greater than two. And if we're doing one minus two, and here's a little clue saying that it's the direction of one minus two. I always put these little clues on my note on my graphs, so I don't lose track of what I'm doing. Yeah, it was in the right direction. T observed is 1.81. T critical was smaller. So T observed is in the rejection region. Our difference is big enough that we reject the null hypothesis that in the population the two means are equal. We say they're not equal. We say Finnish is harder than Navajo or something like that. Which I have no idea about. I don't know either one. I've just heard people say they're hard languages to learn. So action, adventure, and comedy shows equal uh, violent acts. Now Sometimes we specify our null hypothesis in words in a certain way that implies a one-tailed test, and it certainly does, but then we decide to do a two-tailed test just in case, and some people do this. And so I wanted to show you that example that that happens here. So action, adventure, and comedy, I think I did comedy is one and action, adventure is two. Um, I did a two-tailed test. When you have a two-tailed test, it kind of doesn't matter whether you do one minus two or two minus one, except that it has to be consistent throughout, or else you might make an, an error here and there. So, no, no significant difference, no rejection of the null hypothesis, which should alarm you because why wouldn't it be different? Shouldn't, shouldn't comedies have less violence? Yeah. Or maybe your research method sucks. Yeah. All sorts of things to criticize. So these are the kind of tests we're going to learn. Theoretically, there's all these tests. If you have a known population standard deviation, then you've got one group, a one sample Z test, two paired groups, paired sample Z, or two independent groups, independent sample Z. And then all those things happen for a t-test if you don't know the standard deviation. However, we're never going to do those. We're probably not going to do the one sample z very much after this. We use it for proportions tests, but, but just for means, we're just not going to do it because we don't know the population standard deviation. And that's all.